Basically, essentially, we got a limit switch rollout that's tripped on the carrier furnace. We're going to yank out the blower and take a look at the secondary heat exchanger and see if we can see any corrosion down there. Our hoses here are starting to deteriorate. That's not going to help it a whole lot. Yeah, that's bad. That black stuff usually is from the soot that's starting to accumulate, and that's not usually a good sign. What we're looking for is to see the corrosion right there and if you look in the center here in between the plates you'll see that it's eaten its way through the secondary and then internally in between on the plates themselves you'll end up having delamination so you can see it in there so yes this heat exchanger has failed so this would uh, need to be replaced Another way you could do it is you can yank the draft motor and look at it through there. But basically, this here to me seems to be a little bit easier. What we'll end up doing is we'll end up getting a whole new primary and secondary heat exchanger. And then when I do that, we'll check the igniter, make sure the igniter's under, you know, the 90 ohms rating. And then I'll go ahead and clean everything out. Also, another thing with this being propane gas. The burners usually are getting rusted, which is what's going on there. So I replace the burners too, because that can cause a lot of your issues also. Because when they get dirty and rusted like that, the combustion process gets messed up and it burns dirty. And that also helps contribute to issues down the line. We're also gonna have to get a couple hoses to get that back up and going. Okay, let's check our igniter here and see what we got. That way we can get all of our parts figured out in advance. Okay, we're at 80 ohms, so technically we're in spec pretty much in the middle of its life expectancy. So that's always an option. You may want to just do it now, that way it's done and out of the way. And because this one's on a propane kit, and I don't remember if I mentioned it or not, a lot of times we'll have a little pressure, low pressure cutout on it. So, uh, and then the burners, like I said, we're gonna get those in the in the price also. We've got the information as far as the model and serial number, so we gotta get a hold of the supplier and find out what's covered and what's not. Right now, if he has a heat pump, we're gonna try to wire it up so it'll run the heat pump even though it's cold outside. Uh, it'll be better than nothing. Uh, and at least then that'll help, you know, supplement the heat. You can always add an electric heater or something like that to help get by. Temperature's 24. It's wanting to go straight to auxiliary heat, but we don't want the gas furnace to run. So we're going to just go ahead and lock it into auxiliary heat. Might as well. We're basically not going to hook up W. We're going to just run it right out to Y. So we're going to see how that works versus having to reprogram the thermostat and tell it that it's a heat pump with electric strips and all that stuff to trick it. This will get around having to mess around with any reprogramming in it. Now, unfortunately, it's not going to do great, but it'll at least give them some heat. Okay, we're going to change this around a little bit to take a little fuse. We end up hooking, unhooking the W wire from the outside unit, which is your return auxiliary heat, and we unhook Y from the thermostat. So, essentially, since this is an auxiliary heat, W1 is coming down and connecting to Y, powering the contactor. The heat pump runs uh, in heat mode when O is not energized. So O is obviously not energized because we're in heat mode. The fan's going to come on automatically when it hits the Y terminal. And uh, that's why the fan came on immediately. So right now we're just waiting for the outdoor unit to come out of delay. Uh, and then uh, if that works, we should be good to go until uh, we can get back with a new heat exchanger. We've gone ahead and turned the gas valve off and the gas stopped, so both of those things are off. Uh, the furnace isn't going to run. We'll put the uh, condensate trap back in there and then uh, we're just waiting for the time delay to kick out. 
Uh, I can feel a little bit of warmth on it, so it's starting to try to heat, but like I said, it's kind of cold out, so it's not going to put out a lot of heat, but it's going to be better than nothing. Uh, basically, I had back feed from that Y terminal on the thermostat, so that's why it caused me some issues there. So we'll go ahead and take that jumper out, put a new fuse in there. We'll go outside and make sure the heat pump's running. Go ahead and check his propane tank. He's at 50%, so we know it didn't run low and cause it. Plus, by looking at that heat exchanger like we did, we know that it's pretty well failed. It has nothing to do with the pressure being low, but those are also things you want to just look at. That way you can help him find these things out in advance. So, here's the heat pump. It is running. And this thing here is looking a little old too. It's a 97. So how well does it work? I mean, it's definitely feeling warm for as cold as it is out here. Look at the uh, exhaust stack here. This is another thing you can look at if you're doing your maintenances and you see that black stuff growing in there. That's a black soot of death. That's a sure sign that things aren't good uh, unless, you know, it's an old uh, failure that just now is, you know, you're just having to be seeing it. but. So anyhow, I mean, it wouldn't be a bad idea to know, you know, to mention, hey, maybe you should do the whole upgrade while you're at it. It's an R22 unit. So, I mean, we can present options. It just depends on what the customer wants to do. All you can do is give them the information and let them make an informed decision from that point. Right now, at this point, this is about as much as we can do for right now. We'll get the parts ordered and get back as soon as we can and get him up and going. And he can uh, use some electric heaters or some other alternative uh, heat source to get himself by. But at least we've done what we can to at least get him something. All right, got a new uh, fuse in there. Got my wires all tucked in and out of the way. I don't know if it was truly a back feed or if maybe one of these wires pushed into the metal or something. I'm not sure, but everything seems to be fine. Uh, I've got that trap back in there. Traps are definitely something you want to clean out every time you're doing a service. Uh, this particular one here looks kind of dirty, so it, uh, I'll clean that when I come back if I replace the heat exchanger. I'm not needing to hook any of that stuff back up really, but went ahead and did it. Just uh, basic so you don't lose it. That's going to wrap this one up here. It's just some things that uh, you can do to try to get somebody by if the heat exchanger goes out and they have no other form of heat. Luckily, he does have a couple electric heaters, so... Uh, it's a pretty good sized house, but this is at least going to help out a little bit. Not a lot, but it will help some. All right, we're working on a ream furnace, and we're not a ream dealer. But basically, the flame sensor was dirty, and I was cleaning it, and it broke it. So we're going to braze this thing back together while we order on my new part. I've not tried this before, so we're going to see if this works. Basically, we're going to use our flux and... 45% solder here, braze rod, whatever, and see if this works. I'm hoping it does, because otherwise I'm going to have to try to go find something else to make work. Put a little bit of flux on that thing, a little bit on our rod itself, and we'll just put a real small flame on this thing. Never tried this, so we're gonna see if this works. No idea if it's going to. Wow. Check that out. Unbelievable. Now obviously I don't recommend this as being a permanent fix. That silver solder should be able to handle that flame from the furnace is not going to be real super hot compared to the flame of the acetylene. Basically what I used was my uh, pliers here for a pinch off tool. But uh, yeah, it looks like it worked perfectly. Unbelievable. Looks like it ain't even broke. Yeah, it pulled right into that crack and... Huh, I'm not going to try to break it. Yeah. Looks to me like it worked, so we're going to put it in there and see how it does. 
I mean, I definitely would not recommend this as a permanent fix by any means or stretch of the imagination. But at this point, when you're nowhere near a supply house, you don't uh, got one on the truck. That's uh, potentially a way to get around, get her out of a, a pickle. Worst case scenario, it fails. They're right back where they're at right now. As you can see, that's the reason why it's very difficult to get it in there. So it's got to go like that. And literally, you cannot get your fingers in there. Should come in no surprise why this would happen. Push that in. Now before, the orange light right there was blinking, which usually means flame issue. It should be solid. Got a solid. I'm making about an hour and a half round trip to go get the part. Like I said, this is not a permanent fix. It's just a pickle taker upper. Uh, so it's kind of generic. I like I said, I'm not gonna leave it like this. She does look pretty good. Here's what I use to clean my flame sensors. I've used this for years and years. It's just a stainless steel brush. It's not overly aggressive. It doesn't leave any grooves in the uh, flame sensor, causing it to absorb the nasty crap that gets baked into it while it's running. Uh, this has worked for me for years. And like I said, for me, I think this is the best thing over a scouring pad and a dollar bill and sandpaper and all the other crazy crap out there. I've tried everything from cleaners, you name it, just for experimental purposes, and this has been the best thing so far. This is just a quick tip minute, if you want to call it that. If you like the video, please like, share, and subscribe. We'll catch you on the next one.